So we're in Exodus 34 this morning, so you can go ahead and turn there. Um, while you're turning there, um, we're, we're going to take an in-depth look at, at Moses today. And, uh, and oftentimes when we think of Moses, we think of him as more than a man. And uh, we remember Moses in, in Hebrews, how he's in the Hall of Faith, and how he walked incredibly close to the Lord. And, uh, and so he's just kind of this figure that's, that's set up um, above us, and we think, man, Moses is incredible. And it's true. Moses is incredible. And Moses did walk incredibly close to the Lord. But oftentimes what we forget is, is Moses' beginning. How when he was first called by the Lord in Exodus chapters 3 and 4, um, if you guys remember, the Lord was in, um, in the burning bush. And he was talking to Moses. And, and he told Moses what he wanted him to do. He gave him his calling. And, and Moses' re- response, he was scared. Um, if we look at chapter 4, verse 10, or I'll read it to you. It says, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in past time, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. So Moses, he had, he had a fear. He had a real fear, and he didn't feel like he was qualified. He didn't feel like he was eloquent enough, and, and he just didn't feel like he would be a good job, like that he would do a good job. He didn't feel like he would be a good leader, and uh, he didn't think he was the right guy for the job. And those same feelings that Moses had reminds me of the last, last time that I, I taught, my first time. Jim asked me a year ago to teach, and, uh, and I was so scared, and I was nervous, and, uh, and you know, as, as I got up here, I kind of felt like I was going to puke, and, uh, <laughs> but remembering that, and I think um, the reason I said yes, it wasn't to please Jim. It wasn't so I could make him happy or because he thought I should, um, but it was because I felt like that's what the Lord had for me to do, and it was an opportunity for me to respond to God's calling, and no, I wasn't qualified, and today I'm still not qualified, but I'm called, and that's, that's the key. That's the key in Moses' life, and that's the key in all of our lives, so I want to look at Exodus 34. Um, but uh, if you guys remember, Moses is up on Mount Sinai, and he's receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord. But before that, um, in Exodus 32, um, we see that while Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments from the Lord, um, what happens is, is um, he's up there for 40 days, and, and the Israelites, they become impatient. And they're like, what happened to Moses and Joshua? Well, I don't know. I th- must have died. And uh, so they get this great idea of, well, you know, if, if we don't have Moses, then we need someone else to lead us, and we need a God to worship. So they come to Aaron, and Aaron's like, oh, that seems like something I could do. And so he crafts this golden calf. Um, he, he takes some jewelry from the Israelites, and he makes this small golden calf. And then next, he builds this altar, and then he says, the next day, you know, we'll come together, and we'll worship and sacrifice to this God. Um, And so what he's doing is he's leading the people in idolatry. He's taking them to worship another god, a false god. And um, and so the mo and then so meanwhile, while Moses is up on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, um, the Lord speaks to Moses in chapter 32, um, verse seven. It says, "Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, whom you have brought up from the land of Egypt." Have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I, which I commanded them. They have made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it. This is this is your God, O Israel, who have brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate people. Now then, let me alone, and my anger may burn against them. And they may destroy them, or and I may destroy them, and I will make you a great nation. So the Lord, He knows what's going on, and uh, and He tells Moses, and uh, and then He says, "Leave me alone." And and God is upset. He's angry. He wants to destroy the Israelites. He wants to destroy His people. And so He tells Moses, "Leave me alone, so my anger may burn, and I'm going to destroy these people, and I'm going to make a new nation through you." And then um, Moses, instead of leaving, he has his back and forth with the Lord while he acts as Israel's intercessor. And he goes before the Lord, and it comes to a point in verse 14 of chapter 32. It says, So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to the people. 
Um, so, um, and so Moses changes God's mind. Um, and then what happens is Moses goes down um, to the camp and Moses is upset. He sees what the people are doing, how they're worshiping this golden calf and, uh, and they're just having this drunkard party and he breaks the Ten Commandments. He's so upset and uh, he whips the Israelites back into shape. People die in the process and Israel or, and uh, Moses points to them um, just, just the serious nature of the sin that they've committed, their idolatry they've committed. And uh, that brings us to chapter 34, where we're going to be today. Um, and the beauty of Exodus 34 is God renews the covenant he made with Israel after their sin and their worship of the golden calf. And so this is an encouraging um, part of scripture for us. Um, so let's, let's start. First one, it says... Um, Now the Lord said to Moses, cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets, which you shattered. So be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of the mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and he took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and in truth. He keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. Yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquities of our fathers and on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Moses made haste to bow low towards the earth and worship. Verse 9. And he said, If now I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray let the Lord go um, among among in in our midst, even though the people are obstinate, and pardon our iniquities and our sin, and take us uh, as your own possession. Then Then God said, Behold, I am going to make a covenant before all the people. And I will perform miracles which have not been preceded in all the earth, nor among any nations. And all the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord. For it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with you. So the first thing I want to bring out is I want to look at verses 6 and 7 again. It's so incredible. So the Lord passes before, before Moses and he says this to him. The Lord, the Lord God compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and in truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquities, transgressions, and sin. So there's the good news. That's the first, that's the first part of it. So we look at how Moses approached, um, how Moses approached the Lord. He came, to, he came to the Lord humbly. He came to him broken by Israel's sin. He was crushed. He was the leader. And while he was gone, the people just decided, well, Moses is gone, so let's just move on to the next thing. And so this broke his heart. And so he's come to the Lord, and, uh, and we see that he's humble. Later on, we're going to read just how humble Moses is. Um, but I think that this, that this is encouraging for each one of us, because through, through this week, we all um, take on the weight of the world. And, and uh, we see, we, we experience the sin, you know, that we've, that we've sinned and, um, and, and we bring it to church with us and we're weighed down. And, but if you come to the Lord humble, if you come to him with a, with a broken spirit and, and you bow down before him, then this is, Lord, this is how the Lord is going to greet you. It says he's compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and in truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquities, transgressions, and sin. And then the second part is, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquities of the father on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. So we wonder, who is the guilty? Well, if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're the guilty. 
and you won't go unpunished. Um, so there's, there's the bad news. Um, but the first point I want to bring out to you guys today is I want to look at how Moses pursues the Lord. Um, so, <clears throat> so we see the first, the first thing that I want to bring out is chapter 33, verse 18. Look at that with me. It says, um, Then Moses said, I pray you show me your glory. So Moses was after God's glory. He was seeking him. Um, He was praying to him. And then in chapter 34, verse 8, it says, um, after um, the Lord had passed by in front of Moses, Moses made haste to bow low towards the earth and worship. So we see, look at the posture of Moses. He's humble. He's bowed down before the Lord. He doesn't approach the Lord proud, but he's bowed down and he's worshiping him. And then the next verse I want to look at is um, verse 28 of chapter 34. It says, so he, w- so he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water, and he wrote on the tablets the word of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. So, so we see that Moses was with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. And the cool thing about this is it's incredible. He didn't eat or drink the whole time. This is, this is amazing. It's a miracle. This isn't something I'm prescribing that we all wait on the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights because if we do that, there will be no more Calvary Arlington unless God does a miracle. Um, but we see that, that Moses is serious about being completely focused on the Lord. And, and, Moses, and God is focused on Moses being completely focused on him because we see in verse 3 of chapter 34, God says, No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Remember last time, Joshua was halfway up the mountain, and he was there and he was waiting for Moses. And I think, well, why not bring Joshua? Why not, you know, because Joshua didn't do anything wrong last time. And my thought there is, is I wonder if while Moses was in the glory of the Lord and while he was spending all that time with him, I wonder if he thought, what's going on with Joshua? I wonder if he's still there. And, and the Lord didn't want to have any distractions for Moses. So he says, no man, not even on the mountain. And then the second half of verse three, he says, even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of the mountain. He didn't even want any animals in front of the mountain, let alone on the mountain. So the Lord is completely focused on having our focus, 100% on him, no distractions. And I think uh, a good passage for us to turn to is Luke chapter 8. Go ahead and turn there with me. I want to look at the story about the woman with the hemorrhage. So we're going to start in verse 42, about halfway through. It says, um, But as he went, the crowds were pressing in on him. It's talking about Jesus. So he's surrounded by a crowd. Everybody's pressing in on him. And then verse 43, And a woman who had um, a hemorrhage for 12 years and could not, um, could not be healed by anyone came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. And immediately... Her hemorrhage stopped. And Jesus said, Who is the one who touched me? And uh, while they were all denying it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowded and pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone did touch me, for I was aware of the power that had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she had not escaped notice, um, she came trembling and fell down before the Lord and declared in the presence of all the people the reason why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. So the first thing I want to look at is we see how um, the woman with the hemorrhage, how she approached the Lord after after she found out that she hadn't escaped notice. So she comes to the Lord, she bows down on her knees, and she's trembling. She is humble. 
and she's before the Lord, and then she cries out amongst a mixed crowd, because I'm sure not everyone that was following Jesus was following because he was their Lord and Savior. So this kind of reminds me of the idea of being baptized. It, sometimes it's in a public place, and, uh, and it's fun because people are declaring what the Lord has done and that they're going to follow the Lord. And so I always enjoy being at a baptism and, uh, and enjoy watching people make that public declaration. Like this woman, she declared that, that she was healed. And then the next thing I want to look at is we see um, that she presses in on Jesus. So it says that there's this crowd around him and that all these people are pressing in on him. They all want, to, they all want a piece of the glory, you know. Um, and and uh, so she's pressing in on him. But if I think about it, um, I think... You know, the people that would be pressing in on, on the Lord, and I, and I bet that it would be mostly dominated by a crowd of men. And, uh, and I think about how, how difficult it would be for her when people are all surrounded by the Lord, but this woman, she's got a need, just like so many of us have needs. And what she does is she presses through the crowd and she touches the back of his cloak, and she's healed. And why is she healed? Because she presses in on the Lord. She's pursuing the Lord. And then we see that God isn't turned off by, by her neediness, just like God isn't turned off by our neediness. We come to the Lord and we have real needs. We have health scares, we have diseases, um, we've got all sorts of things that we need the Lord for. And God's not turned, out by, turned off by that. In fact, he likes it when we seek him. Um, and so, and then we'll look back at that other point um, is, is how we're supposed to get rid of the distractions. While we're pursuing the Lord, we need to get rid of all distractions. Um, <clears throat> it reminds me of this, um, or let's see, excuse me. It says, then um, before the Lord, when we're before the Lord, do we have the right posture? Um, and that reminds me of this, this story that Anna Wilson shared at home group when she said she was vi- visiting Jerusalem and she went to the Wailing Wall and she said it was amazing how the Jews there um, how they worship God, and they cried out to him in a public place. And I think, do we have the right posture? Are our knees bent before the Lord like that? Um, and I think oftentimes, um, what, are, what are we fighting to pursue the Lord? We're, we're fighting against our flesh. Our flesh doesn't want to pursue the Lord. And then oftentimes, I think of our culture. In our culture, it's, it's difficult to pursue, to pursue the Lord. There's a lot of distractions that we experience I think of um, when I first get in the car in the morning. What do I do? I turn on the radio or I put in a CD or I listen to a podcast. It's never quiet. I get to work. Maybe if I'm allowed to, I'll put in headphones. And, uh, and then when, you know, on the ride home, same thing. I'm listening to music or doing something. And then anytime I have a, a downtime, I'm, I'm checking Twitter. What's going, on in, in this, what's going on in the world? And then when you're home, you, you watch the news or you hop on Facebook or whatever. And oftentimes, we're so caught up in the busyness of life that we don't know how to truly pursue the Lord, that we don't know how to be quiet before Him, and we don't know how to receive from Him. And that comes um, through a developed prayer life. Um, oftentimes, we, we pray to God when there's times of trouble, um, and that's good. It's our natural reaction as Christians. When there's trouble in our lives, we should give it to the Lord. Um, but a healthier prayer life goes to Him daily. Not just about troubles, not just about prayer requests that you need, but just spending time with him in prayer, hearing from him. And a goofy example of this in my life is um, probably a month or two ago, I borrowed my dad's truck, and it used to be my old truck, and I love this truck. I I have a soft spot in my heart for this truck. And uh, so I borrowed it and filled it up full of garbage and went to the Arlington dump and uh, and, and it was a busy day there. So as I was coming out, I was, I was waiting in line. There's probably 10 cars, which, which is a lot for that dump. And, uh, and I'm about halfway through the line, and the truck starts to, to idle roughly. And I'm thinking, oh, no. And so I put it in neutral, and I've got my, ga- my foot on the gas a little bit to get the RPMs up. And, and immediately I'm praying, Lord, please don't let this truck break down. I'm not equipped to fix it. I'm not going to know what to do. I'm going to have to have it towed or something. And, uh, and then I look behind me, and, and there's this truck overheating. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want to be that guy. And, and I look, what's coming for him? A forklift. A forklift's coming to, to push him out of the way. And I'm thinking, no, this is coming for, for me next. And it's just a goofy example. It's like through a truck, 
through a trial in my life, I was like, Lord, please, like, don't let this happen to me. And, it, and as Christians, we turn to God. But I would say, what was I listening to before that? Well, of course, I had the radio on, like I mentioned, but I had sports radio on. And there's nothing wrong with sports radio. But the idea here is, is I need to get better at, at carving out time and pursuing the Lord and having time where it's quiet having time where there's not distractions. And I think of um, in, my, in my personal prayer life, in my devotion time, if I ever try to do it when, uh, when we have a, a one and a half year old um, and she just runs around and she's just full of energy and now she's just, she's learned how to run, so she runs everywhere. And, uh, and she's always getting my attention and wants something from me. And, and so if I'm trying to do my quiet time where Andy can find me, it's gonna be full of distractions. And, but we need to remember back in Exodus um, 34.3 that God calls us to get rid of the distractions. I'm not equating Andy to the cattle. Um, <laughs> she's, you know, but I need to get rid of the distractions. I need to find a place that's quiet. Um, and oftentimes that's, that's at night for me. Another good opportunity that we have is in the morning. So when, when other people aren't awake, it's like that's when you can pursue the Lord without distractions. And that's why... Um, personally, I don't like carpooling. I'll do it for financial reasons and because other people like to carpool. But when you're alone in the car, you can spend that time with the Lord. But when you're with another person in the car, it's full of distractions. And, um, <clears throat> and so the next point I want to bring out is how Moses receives from the Lord. So let's look back at Exodus 34. <clears throat> We're going to pick up in uh, verse 27. It says, um, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there, on the, he was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights, and he did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the Ten Commandments the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Verse 29. And it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimonies were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of speaking with him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. So we see the two things that, that Moses receives from the Lord. The first one is he receives the Ten Commandments, right? And what's the Ten Commandments? It's, it's God's Word. And then the next thing he receives is this shining face. And this is so amazing because you would think that after 40 days and 40 nights, Moses would be crawling down the mountain. And his face wouldn't be shining, it would be pale because he's malnourished. But what we see is, is the Lord took care of his needs, Moses was with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without food, and he came down and his face was just shining bright. And it's incredible. And this ties into our first point that you can't be changed unless you first pursue God. So time spent with God actually affects your outward appearance. Um, so we see that Moses' face wasn't just glowing, but it says in verse 29 and verse 30, it says that it's shown. Well, the Hebrew word for shown is Quran, which means to shine, to send out rays. It was so extreme that Aaron and, uh, and all the Israelites were intimidated to come near him. Um, but we see that Moses didn't have any pride in this. In fact, we see in verse 29 that he wasn't even aware that his face was shining. It must have been a sunny day. Otherwise, he would have picked up on that little headlamp coming out. But, uh, so if we look at Numbers um, chapter 12, verse 3, um, it says, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. And that's incredible, the fact that Moses was more humble than any man on the face of the earth. And so we see that even if Moses did realize that his face was shining, he wouldn't have had any pride in it. Oftentimes when God does something through us, we think, yeah, I was a part of that. And then all of a sudden it's, yeah, God was a part of that. And all of a sudden it was like, man, I'm a smooth talker. And, and naturally we, we try to swoop in there and we, we take the glory for ourselves. 
But look at how Moses, it says in Numbers 12, 3, that he's the most humble man. And, uh, and that, that's so cool. And we see in Acts 4, 13, that you can actually be changed by spending time with Jesus Christ. It says, now as they observed his confidence, now talking about they, it's talking about um, the Pharisees. As they observed the confidence of Peter and John, they understood that they were uneducated and untrained men. And they were amazed, and they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. And that's incredible, because these Pharisees are like, there's something different about these guys. What is it? And they're like, that's right. They were with Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. And it changed the way they looked. It changed the way they acted. And, and it's incredible. And, but these, these references are good, but it's not just stories in the Bible that people are changed by the Lord and by spending time with Him. Um, just this last month, um, I met this guy named John Pinky on the job, and, um, and, and I was around him. I'm not work- he's not in the same trade, um, but I was working around him, and I was noticing, man, this guy's a hard worker. And he's probably maybe in his early 50s or late 40s, somewhere in there, and he's like a really hard worker. I'm like, man, I'm having a hard time keeping up with this guy. He's running everywhere. And I wasn't seeing him sipping on some Red Bull or coffee or anything like that. But it was just this natural energy. And he's just driven. And then the next thing I notice is, I haven't heard this guy swear once. Guys, guys have a, you know, they, they swear a lot on their job site. But this guy, I didn't hear him swear at all. I was like, there's something different about this guy. And then I noticed how he treated other people with respect. And, and, and I'm like, this guy has to be a Christian. And so I, I go up to him and I introduce myself, and I'm like, hey, I'm Jason, and I've just been watching you, and are you a Christian? And he's like, as a matter of fact, I am. And he's all happy, and he's like, are you? And I'm like, I am. And, and so I'm getting to know this guy, and, and the first thing he says is, he's like, do you have anything to pray about? I like to pray. And, and that just confirms it, like, that he was changed because of the time he spent with God. And it's through prayer. That's how we spend time with God, and that's how we're affected by God. It's through prayer. It's through His Scripture, and, and it's so cool, and I love having that experience when you see that there's something different about, about somebody, and, and it turns out to be Jesus. And then um, on that same job, I, I met another guy whose name was John, and it was the same thing. He just had this smile. He just had this joy. I'm like, are you a Christian? He's like, I am. And, and so it's fun to be able to identify Christians. And that is how we should be able to identify Christians, by how they act, by their personality. It's because of ourself, we're, we're kind of negative people. We can tend to be grumpy. But when we're filled with the Spirit, when we spend time with the Lord, we've got this natural joy. And it comes out of us. And people can see the difference in you. Um, now, the same thing works the opposite direction as well. Another time I was on this job and this, this taper got here. We'd been there for months and it was his first week on this job. And man, he tilted the room, but in a bad way. All of a sudden, everybody was grumbling and he just was a super negative guy. And he was grouchy. And I took break around him and everyone around him was grouchy. And it wasn't that they didn't like this guy. This guy was fine. They all thought, you know, that's just Joe or whatever his name is. And, uh, but he was so negative that it just affected the people around him. And so um, Daniel Fusco, he's a Calvary pastor, he has this acronym, it's DBG, which means don't be grumpy. And it's kind of a fun one. And, uh, and it's just this idea that as Christians, we're not supposed to be grumpy. No one, no one comes to the Lord because they're like, man, that guy's different. He's extra grumpy. I would like to be like that. <laughs> no. People see that there's negative things going on in our lives because everybody has trials going on in their lives. And they're like, man. How does he have that joy, even though this is going on in his life? It's through time spent with the Lord. It's through prayer. It's, it's Jesus Christ that changes us. Um, and so we see in, back in Exodus 34, 30, um, that sometimes shining bright for God is a turnoff to other believers, right? When uh, Aaron, Aaron saw Moses, this guy was gone for 40 days. And uh, so he's gone for 40 days and the people don't like run up. It's like, oh, Moses, how are you? It's good to see you. Instead, it's like, oh, whoa, what's going on with his face? And they stay away from him. In fact, Moses has to call him over. And so we see that it's, it can be intimidating to, even to believers and to non-believers when they see that you have this, this thing about you, that, that you've been changed by the Lord. Um, and uh, so we see that as Christians, 
um, we're called to, to shine bright for him. And, uh, and so Matthew 5.16 says, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we see that Moses first pursued the Lord and then he receives from the Lord. And our next point is how Moses pours out what he receives from the Lord. So I'm going to read verses 31 and 32. It says, Then Moses called to them, Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation, um, and they returned to him. And Moses spoke to them. Afterwards, all the sons of Israel came near, and, uh, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. So, Remember, Moses receives the Ten Commandments, so which is the word of God, and now he's giving it out to first the leaders, and then he's giving it out to the congregation. And so we see that Moses is investing in God's people. There's an application there for us as well. Um, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but each one of us is called to give out the gospel. Um, we went through Romans 10, or at least the second half of it, um, a couple weeks ago. Jim took us through it. In Romans 10, verses 14 and 15, it says this, How then will they call upon him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. Um, and like Jim had mentioned um, a couple of weeks ago, the Greek word for preacher used here is uh, kyrios. Um, which means to be a herald. And I think I just butchered that, but that's okay. But that, that word preacher means to be a herald. It doesn't mean to be a preacher or a pastor or have the gift of evangelism. It's not about that. It's about being a herald. Each one of us is called to be a herald, and it's to bring out the good news. It's to share the gospel. Um, and that reminds me of, of my dad. He got the opportunity um, just last weekend to share the gospel with his sister and with his brother-in-law who has cancer. And, um, and it's so cool because the Lord used him and they both accepted Christ. And it's just awesome. And it's so cool to be a part of that. And it's not that my dad's just this smooth talker and connived him into it, but it's all because of Jesus Christ. And it's all because um, he made himself available. My dad was, in this case, he was the herald. He, he brought the good news. And, um, and so each one of us is called to do that. But oftentimes we don't share because we're intimidated or we feel unqualified. And I think back to Moses early on how he, he didn't want to share. Aaron had to be his mouthpiece. He had to go before Pharaoh because Moses was scared. He was intimidated. And he didn't, he didn't feel like he was the right guy for the job. And oftentimes that's how we feel. We don't feel like we're qualified to share the gospel to think, well, Maybe, what if they ask me a question that I don't know? Well, the Spirit will speak to you. And, and if you don't know, you can find out. People aren't turned off by saying, I don't know. I'll, I'll figure that out and get back to you. That doesn't make people upset. But we're called to be that mouthpiece. We're called to share the gospel. We're, call, we're called to be a part of what God is doing. And this is how Moses pours out. And this is how each one of us is called to pour out. It's by, um, by sharing the good news. And then also there's uh, this quote from Jack Hibbs. It's where I got it from. It's, it's not about being qualified. It's about being called. And I think that's so true because what, what qualifies you? Your calling. God qualifies you. And I think about my biggest fear in high school and middle school is that the teacher would look out into the audience, Jason, why don't you read? And it was like, no. And, and I, I had played the phonics game because I wasn't good at reading. I was in summer school because I wasn't good at reading. And I'm still not good at reading. <laughs> but so that was my biggest fear, and, along with uh, public speaking. And, and the thing about that is it can be crippling because it's this fear. It's like, oh, I can't do that. You know, that is, I'm not good at that. I'm not qualified. I, I just can't. And, but the truth is, is if God calls you to do it, it's better that you're not qualified because maybe if you're qualified to do it, you'll think, oh, I'm so good. You know, I delivered a great message. But no, it's God's so good. God worked through me. And it's encouraging when we're not qualified at something, but God uses us to do it anyways. Um, so I want to look at Matthew 9, verses 37 and 38. Um, Jesus says to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, 
but the workers are few. Therefore, besiege the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. So God looked out and he saw that there's a lot of work to be done. He didn't look over at his 12 disciples and say, well, you guys better get going. There's a lot of work to do. You know, we're running out of time here. That's not the way the Lord works. He says, there's a lot of work to be done. You guys better get praying. And he says, pray that more people will be a part of the harvest. And so that's, that's our second thing that, our second way that we're supposed to pour out. It's through prayer. Um, and so in each one of these points, in pursue, receive, pour out, prayer is the underlining thing here. It's that we're supposed to pray for people. We're supposed to be a part of praying for our uh, unbelieving co-workers, praying for our believing co-workers, for our friends, for our family, because God wants to do a work in them. And who knows? He might use you to do it, even if you feel unqualified. Um, and it's fun to be a part of God's work. Um, <clears throat> and so, and back to that guy, John Pinky, uh, while I'm working around him, it's fun because he's like, hey, you know, could you pray for my daughter-in-law? She she's, uh, has food poisoning. And so on Friday, I was, I was working away and thinking about his daughter-in-law and praying that, praying that she would have relief and praying that she would be healed from it. And, and I was able to give him prayer requests. I was like, hey, you know, on Sunday, could you be praying for me? And, and he's probably praying for me right now. And it's fun to work around people that pray. It's fun to work, to be around Christians that want to pray. Um, A.W. Tozer says, God answers our prayers, not because we are good, but because he is good. I'll say that again. God answers our prayers, not because we are good, but because he is good. And I think that's so true. And this comes back to, we don't earn our way to heaven. You know, we're not good enough. We all know that. It's, it's by grace. And in the same way that God answers our prayers, it's, it's by, by grace. It's because he's good, not because we're good. Um, so the last thing I want to look at is uh, verses 33 and 35, this idea of the veil. Let's read it. Read with me. It says, When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, they had not been, let's see, what they had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses and the skin of his face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went to speak with him. So we see, what's the idea of this veil? And we think, well, maybe initially that when Moses came down into the camp, People were turned off by his shining face, so maybe he put the veil over his face to make him more approachable, or maybe less intimidating. And because he was the leader of the people, after all, he had to deal with the people. Um, but that's not what Paul says. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3.13, he explains that the purpose of the veil um, is to conceal the reality that the glory was fading. Um, and in H.A. Ironside commentary, it says, the glory of the covenant could not last because too much of it depended upon sinful man. So as the glory faded, judgment took its place. So um, because of the new covenant, there is no more need for a veil. There's no more fading glory in Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so Moses' face was changed temporarily, um, and it was changed by the old covenant. But let's be changed permanently by Jesus Christ, by the new covenant, because there's no need for a veil. Um, so if you're here today and you haven't accepted Jesus into your heart, then today's your day. Be changed forever by the new covenant. Be changed by Jesus Christ. And, and the last verse I want to look at is Romans 10.2. It says, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. So, um, and Jim covered this just a couple weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. <laughs> and, uh, and he talked about the zeal and that these Jews had the zeal, but it was through their own self-righteousness. They had a zeal and they were trying to get to heaven by their own self-righteousness. And I think that naturally, each one of us have a real zeal for things. And, and maybe if you've played uh, maybe, uh, what is it, any sort of backyard sport, whether it's badminton or basketball with me or, or anything like that, you'll see that I have a zeal for, for competitive nature. I want to win. 
you know, and I have fun competing. And so that's like my natural zeal. Even when I watch sports, it's like I have this natural zeal. I want, I want my team to win. Um, but we see that it's so important that our zeal is placed on a knowledge of him. Like where the, the Jews messed up, they had this zeal for God. But the zeal was misplaced. It was misplaced because when Jesus came, they rejected him and thought, no, I'm going to stick with this old covenant. Jesus isn't the Messiah. Our, Jesus, our Messiah is still coming. And so they rejected him. And, but the reality is, is if you want to have a real um, knowledge, if you want your zeal to be on him, how you do that is by pursuing him, by receiving from him, and by pouring out into, into others. So if you keep that as your zeal, and if you keep that as your focus, um, then you're going to grow in the Lord, and, you're, and your prayer life is going to grow, and you're going to be blessed. Um, so let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I'm thankful for this message that you gave us this morning, Lord. It's so encouraging, Lord. And I pray, that, I pray that each one of us would pursue you and receive from you and, and pour out what you've given us, Lord. We want to be a part of what you're doing. Lord, I pray that you would use this congregation in a powerful way. Lord, in, in our, um, where we're working, Lord, I just pray that, that you would make each one of us shine bright for you, like Moses' shine. I pray that our faces would shine as well because of time spent with you, Lord. Um, and I just pray that you would give us a sweet time of worship, Lord. Give these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen.